Hey everyone, my name is Brooke and I'm a volunteer with Run For Something, a group that helps young progressives run for office. We are so excited that our two favorite Midwestern moms will be interviewing a few of our candidates today. At Run For Something, our usual motto is don't just march, run for something. But from now until November 6, we're changing it to don't just march, vote. And don't just vote for Congress or governor. Please make sure to check out all those down-ballot races for school board or county commissioner or state legislature. Not only do those officials have a huge effect on your daily life, but I can promise that a lot of those candidates are working their hearts out to make sure that we have a blue wave this year. And they've truly earned your vote. So enjoy the show and see you at the polls. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I'm here with my co-host, Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Hey, Kelly. And in this episode, we are talking to millennial candidates for local office. And so with us in this segment is Elizabeth Bennett Parker, who is running for the city council in Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So we're going to start with our our usual first question, which is, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and and then why you decided to run for city council this year? Sure. I currently help lead a local nonprofit called Together We Bake, and we provide job training and personal development for women in need. We work with women coming out of the criminal justice system, women who are homeless, women who recently immigrated or are facing other sort of adverse circumstances, uh, helping them with job skills, uh, job training, as well as soft skills and personal development and building self-confidence. Before I joined forces with Together We Bake, I had my own business fruit cycle to fight food waste. So taking local fruit that would go to waste, turning it into healthy snacks and using that as an opportunity to create jobs specifically for women with barriers to employment, like women who'd been formerly incarcerated or homeless. So I actually hired my first employee through Together We Bake. And then a couple employees later realized we were doing similar things in terms of trying to help women, uh, making food products, selling them to places like Whole Foods, and that maybe we could actually help more women together. So we joined forces a few years ago. And in terms of sort of why I'm running, November 2016 is the first answer to that. Like a lot of women in this country, I realized that we need more women in office at all levels. And um, the second part is in terms of why city council and why now is that I saw issues affecting the women in our program, uh, things like affordable housing and education affecting the city as a whole. And my mom always told me, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I wanted to, again, step up and try and be a part of that solution. Can you tell us a little bit about Alexandria? All I know is it's fairly close to Washington, D.C. <laughs> That is very accurate. Um, So we are just across the river from Washington, D.C. We have uh, a lot of history. Uh, We actually celebrate our birthday, usually the first Saturday in July, and we're a bit older than the U.S. itself. So we've got, you know, quaint uh, old town with cobblestone streets and historic homes and George Washington slept to your signs and things like that. And then a beautiful waterfront. And we're a city of about 160,000 people like 15 or so square miles. So right now, it looks like all of the current city council members are Democrats. Yes, all of the current city council members are Democrats currently. What is the what does the city council sort of look like? And and what are the elections for it? Sure. So we have six seats on city council that are elected at large, the entire city votes, which is as opposed to our school board, which we have three different districts. So currently, the city council um, is made up, again, all of Democrats, We have one woman on council currently, uh, Councilman Pepper, who's been on city council for about 30 years and is amazing, and then five men. And then our mayor is currently a woman as well, but she was uh, not successful in the Democratic primary. So our current vice mayor is now running unopposed for mayor. And then so there are six Democrats who made it through the Democratic primary. There were 12 of us running in the primary. Six made it through including three women, which is actually really exciting because we have a chance to have a council that actually reflects the population it serves in terms of gender. And I'm pretty sure that's the first time that will happen in terms of having, you know, 50% of the council being women if it's if we're all elected. And we have a really diverse council. 
or slate, I guess I should say again, because we're not elected yet um, in terms of the Democratic slate. So that's really exciting. There's actually, if the Democratic slate is elected, there will be no white men on council. And then um, we are running against mm-hmm. two Republicans and one independent who says he's a Democrat. Okay. And so at least three Democrats will definitely win their seats then. Yeah. So does it, is it just sort of, there's the mayor and then the, the other five and people just vote for their top ones and it's just whoever gets the most votes? Yeah. So the mayor is a separate election and then there's six council seats. Um, and so people vote for yeah their top six and the top six get in. We're not identified, even though we went through a party uh, primary on the Democratic side, there weren't enough Republicans running for there to be a primary on that side. Even though we went through that primary, we're not identified by party on the ballot. Um, so statewide in Virginia, local elections are not identified by party. I and mean, we actually have the Republicans at the top of the ballot before the Democrats. So you said that there were some issues that you had seen and that sort of drove you to run. What are some of those issues? Sure. So I think affordable housing is a huge challenge in Alexandria and in our region. So we've lost about 90% of our affordable housing units over the past 18 years, I believe. Um, And that's obviously not great for a city in terms of our community remaining inclusive. Uh, Most of our city employees and, you know, our teachers and our first responders actually aren't able to afford to live here. So it makes it harder for us to recruit and retain those employees. Um, You know, they have to travel and commute significant distances to get to work. So that's certainly one of them. And I mean, it's not just those individuals, you know, seniors who've lived here for years are seeing their, you know, property taxes go up and concern about, you know, their ability to continue to afford to live in their house on a fixed income. Um, and young families just starting out. I mean, I think I was actually at a panel a couple of weeks ago about affordable housing and someone mentioned that there was currently one single family home available for sale in Alexandria that was less than $500,000. That obviously doesn't include condos and things like that, but that gives you a sense of <laughs> what prices are like here and availability. And then education. Um, so we, in Alexandria, we have a lot of challenges with uh, facilities and capacity. So our high school is, I believe, the largest in the state and growing um, in terms of student population. We have only one high school in our town. And our middle schools and elementary schools and all of our schools, there's been a lot of deferred maintenance. So we have things like pipes bursting and molds and other challenges that are keeping kids out of school or out of optional learning environments that we need to deal with. We have, like I assume most communities, we have uh, an achievement gap that I would like to see us close. We have a large percentage of students on free reduced lunch or students who uh, have English as a second language. So how can we support those students outside of school and make sure that all kids are getting the best education possible for their futures? So you're a millennial, as Kelly mentioned, and I am also a millennial. And as a millennial, I know that sometimes people are surprised that you're old enough to be doing things. <laughs> I'm wondering what the reaction has been to your campaign and what you think the importance is of younger people running. The reaction has been pretty positive. I think people are excited to see um, younger folks getting involved. And actually, again, in terms of the diversity of our slate for council on the Democratic side, um, at least three of us are millennials out of six. And the fourth is like, I think, just technically over the cusp of millennial. (laughs) And our mayor is also just over the cusp of millennial, I think, or vice mayor. So I think it's exciting. And I think sort of, again, going back to an earlier point, Alexandria, millennials actually make up, I believe, the largest demographic group in Alexandria uh, in terms of age. So it's exciting to have a, a council that will reflect that population and can continue to move Alexandria towards the future. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to actually campaign for these seats that are much more hyper local, especially, you know, you got to get your name out there because your uh, party affiliation isn't going to be on the ballot. How do you go about doing that? What are the kinds of things you do to actually campaign? Sure. So the number one thing is knocking on doors. So during the primary, I personally knocked on the doors of more than 5,000 voters. My team did 20,000. Um, so I think that was a huge help in terms of getting my name out there, but also connecting with voters, hearing what issues were important to them. And uh, we did some direct mail, which is also really important because uh, there's a lot of times when people live in locked apartment buildings that you can't get into. Um, so you can't you can't knock on their door even if you want to. So uh, that's sort of how you get your name out there. Obviously, 
Let's see. I also, a few people wrote op-eds in the paper for me, did a little bit of newspaper advertisement, but not too much. Obviously, I go to a lot of different events, social media, pretty standard stuff, I guess. Are there campaign finance rules? I assume there are campaign finance rules when it comes to local elections. What do those look like or, you know, how how restrictive are they? Um, the state of Virginia does not have very restrictive um, campaign finance laws. So there's actually no limitation to how much someone can donate. Anything over $100 becomes public information in terms of, you know, who donated in their occupation and basic information like that. So do you, uh, in this campaigning you do, is any of it sort of jointly with the other Democratic candidates? What does that look like? So after the Democrat, before the Democratic primary, it was obviously all on our own. After the primary, um, we now have sort of a, we're on the same sort of ticket, if you will. Um, so there was a coordinated campaign because our Senator, Senator Kane is up for re-election. Our Congressman, uh, Don Byer, is up for re-election. So we've got sort of a little bit of a unified effort throughout uh, the, all of those races. So the party, uh, the Democratic Party, we all sort of chipped in and or at least all the council <laughs> candidates and mayoral candidates chipped in. Um, so we had a joint script card with all of our you know, names and faces on it. We did a joint mailer and then we'll do a joint uh, sample ballot as well. But unfortunately, you can't necessarily rely on that just by itself. I had to sort of fight at the beginning to make sure that, you know, we had this coordinated group card that was going out with people who were coming to knock doors for Senator Kane. And the script that they were sending didn't even mention the city council race at first. <laughs> so we were on the back of the group card, Senator Kane and Congressman Byer were on the front. So if you didn't flip over that group card, you might not realize uh, that there were any other people on the ballot. So yes, there's a coordinated effort, but at the end of the day, you know, you're still responsible to run your own race. And are these city council positions, uh, are they considered full-time, part-time, paid, volunteer? What does that look like? Sure. Uh, they're considered part-time. They are not, not really part-time. <laughs> they are paid. Um, so the current council actually just raised the salary for the first time in 13 years, I think. So it used to be $27,000 and now it's $37,000. Which in a town where you can't get a single family home for under 500000 <laughs> Right. Yes. I think almost all of the current council members, uh, with the exception of Councilwoman Pepper, have, you know, other full-time jobs. And this is supposed to be part-time. Because we do, we do also have a city council manager form of government. So we have a city manager who is doing a, a lot of things as well. But um, and council meets for actual council meetings twice a month on Tuesday evenings. And then one full Saturday for a public hearing per month, but that's just the basics. You know, during budget season, there's meetings weekly. There are the other boards and commissions, both locally and regionally, that you'll serve on that have meetings. Um, then there's, you know, meetings with constituents and responding to emails and all of that. So the hours add up quickly. And this is a three-year term? Correct. It's a three-year term. Is there any advice that you would like to give to other millennial women who are thinking about running for office? Go ahead and make a list of everyone you know now uh, <laughs> with phone numbers and addresses and email addresses because you'll have to call them all and ask them for money. But honestly, I, don't know, I really love knocking on doors. I think that's incredibly important in a local election. I've had, I mean, beyond just getting, I mean, I've had people literally tell me I will vote for you because you came to my door. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's just really important to connect with voters. I went through a program called Emerge Virginia, which has lots of other chapters in other states. I think there's about 17 of them that trains Democratic women, at least, um, interested in running for office. I'm sure there's also, you know, She Should Run and Emily List does trainings now and all of these great organizations encouraging women to run. Um, and I would definitely go through some of that training um, because it's going to come in handy in terms of just knowing sort of what to expect. That being said, I went through this whole seven month long training. I knew running for office was going to be a lot. I didn't realize until I got into it exactly <laughs> um, mm -hmm. how overwhelming it would be. <laughs> but it's been, I've learned a lot and it's uh, for the most part been a great experience. If our listeners would like to help out your campaign in this uh, final little stretch of time, how can they do that? Sure. My website is elizabethforalx.com and on there you can find links 
to volunteer, which we can do phone banking from anywhere and links to donate, which, you know, money makes campaigns run or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I'd say those are probably the two main ways for folks who aren't in the area. Obviously, if they are in the area, I uh, would love help uh, knocking on doors and all of that in the final few weeks. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for stepping up and running this year. And thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Of course. Thanks for having me. In this segment, we're speaking with Lindsay Judd, the Democratic nominee for Washoe County Commissioner in Nevada. Lindsay, can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and, and why you're running for county commissioner? Well, I'm a mom of two, and I've recently, well, not really recently, I've been out in uh, Washoe County for about two years, a little over two years now. My husband is was born in Reno, and he grew up in Fallon, or a lot of his family is out in Fallon. So he's got some rural cred, as they say. <laughs> but uh, the reason why we moved out here is because we have toddlers. They're one and three. And then his cousins also have younger kids. So it was an opportunity to, you know, raise our kids with family, which was really different since we were coming from South Korea, where we both taught English, but didn't really have much family. You, you, you build an expat community, but it's not quite the same as your mom. Or your dad. <laughs> and then being out here, it's kind of like, you know, you get used to things. And as a stay-at-home mom, I took my kids out a lot. And what ended up happening was I would go out and I'd be like, where are the park benches? You know, why is there nowhere to sit? And I discovered that there were a lot of vagrancy laws that were coming into place. And that our homeless population had just exploded and it didn't really feel like the people who were representing our community really had any experience with poverty or knew really how to, you know, help the situation. And so I felt like um, having some of that kind of experience and a little bit more compassion <laughs> was necessary. And so um, I, I threw my hat into the ring. And what is the job of county commissioner in Washoe County? What What's sort of the, the role that you would be taking on? So county commissioners do a lot of the taxes. So the county has the largest share of, of the taxes out here. There's no income tax in Nevada. And so property tax is where most governments get their income. And so the county is where we get all of the financial resources for our social services, like feeding our seniors, uh, housing our homeless, and um, and our infrastructure, so like our roads and our sewer. So that's like all the things that we need collectively are paid for, and so that that's kind of how they oversee those things. And so yesterday you were on a ride along with the, the fire department. Uh, and I know that fire is a, a big deal in Nevada. What are some of the kinds of things you, you learned on that? That was really incredible. So we went on probably six calls. Um, we did some routine maintenance to fire hydrants. <laughs> and then I got to learn a lot about um, the group and how they interact with each other. But I think one of the one of the more eye-opening things was how our dispatch works or how it doesn't really, how it doesn't work well and improvements that could be made in order to make our call times faster and to minimize confusion for our first responders. So we have, um, we contract out for um, our EMS paramedics. So our ambulances aren't actually county. It's a, it's a RIMSA is the company that we use and Turkey Meadows firefighters, the fire protection district, they are also part um, paramedic. So for every group, there's at least one paramedic on duty, but so they respond to a lot of the same calls because we don't have a regional dispatch. We, the calls get handed off to people. And so we have multiple responders going to the same call. 
So it just creates like duplicity that we don't need and confusion. So what are some of the the other issues you, you talked a little bit about poverty and homelessness? What are some of the other issues that you think are, are really important uh, in the county right now and, and things that you're hearing as you talk to people? One of our biggest issues is housing. Housing costs have just skyrocketed. So we've got, you know, a lot of our seniors who are on fixed income are paying up to 60% of their fixed income on rent. So we're seeing some seniors leaving the area, you know, selling their homes and moving to Tennessee. And then we're also just seeing like families unable to afford housing. So our homeless population has really grown and it's really wild. Actually, right now, our um, our HUD vouchers aren't big enough to cover a studio. So we get our vouchers are $740. And we have 250 families that are waiting for housing to open up that's at that cost. There's nothing out there for that. The average apartment is 1200 So it's like the government's not able to keep up because the housing is just moving so quickly. What has campaigning been like? How has Washoe County traditionally voted and, and how is your campaign being received? Traditionally, this district, so I'm in the, the fifth district, which is the north part of Washoe. It's, it's 89% of the geographical area, but only a fifth of the population. So it's really rural. And um, traditionally, it's a, it's a really Republican area. The incumbent who I'm going up against is a constitutional conservative. So it's kind of like it's kind of like going up against or or that she's like in with the, uh, you know, like the Bundys. So it's a different kind of Republican. It's not really a Tea Party. It's it's a different it's a almost an anti-federalist group. Um, And so I think that 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 is something that's that's different. Ryan Bundy is on the ballot out here in Nevada. And so for me, it's a little like kind of that's who I feel like I'm going up against. (laughs) You know, for for some people out here, he's a hero. You know, so it's a little, it feels a little tough at times. But I mean, even in the primary, I went up against an establishment Democrat who had a lot of party support. He ended up raising 46000 and I raised 600 and I got through the primary. So I think that people are looking for something that's new and fresh that kind of speaks to them on a level. And I think that's that's what this campaign is doing, you know, being family focused and, you know, coming from, you know, a moral place that's, you know, I think people find it relatable. Family focused. You mentioned you're a mom of two kids. What's it like running for office as a mom? It's really, it's really fun. And I think a lot of people like, you know, all all the moms out there kind of understand where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to do. And then I think, (laughs) you know, there's, there's some camaraderie there, but I think also it shows other moms that, you know, we can be involved in politics and we can be involved in our local government. Because that's one of the challenges that we face is how do we go to city meetings? How do we go to our local party meetings and feel welcome? You know, because we've got these kids who, you know, run in circles and eat all the cookies and are loud. So it's just showing like we can do these things and we can be informed, you know, and we can bring our kids And how fun and awesome is that? Do your kids have any idea what's going on? (laughs) (laughs) We've been working on, um, like, getting my older son, who's almost four, to say things like mommy for commissioner or um, paid for by friends (laughs) with Lindsay Dunn, you know. But, (laughs) (laughs) you know, just getting them to be more involved. He likes uh, pointing out my, my signs, like, whenever we drive by a yard sign or a road <laughs> sign, you know, that's mommy, that's mommy's <laughs> sign. Look, mom, it's you. <laughs> so I think going into a place where I'll be working, you know, 40 hours a week, that's maybe not something necessarily that they're, that they've been prepped for, but that's kind of what campaigning is anyway. You know, my mom lives with me, so 
it's a whole family extravaganza. <laughs> I saw on your Facebook page you're sending out lots of direct mail. Uh, What are some of the other things you're doing uh, right now in this final little stretch of time as people are actually starting to vote? So we have a lot of ballot questions that are up right now that change the state constitution. And so one of the things that I'm trying to get ahead of is them. (laughs) (laughs) So I put in like radio ad buys a few weeks back and uh, I bought up billboards and I did all these things that I had no intention of doing, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) including the mailers, you know, but at some point you realize like I am one person, you know, regardless of how many volunteers I have, I'm still just one person or 10 people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and I have to figure out how to make myself into many. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so like Facebook ads and billboards and radio and all this crazy stuff. I haven't done a video yet, <laughs> but just trying to get ahead of everybody else. Cause I mean, Nevada and, and Washoe County in particular are kind of in the national spotlight because we have um, a really contentious mm-hmm. uh, Senate race that's happening. And then our, our legislature actually has the, possibility of becoming the first uh, woman majority legislature uh, this cycle. And so there's a lot of focus on politics right now on, on the larger scale. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? I've worked really hard to get here. <laughs> and uh, I think that the reason why people appreciate it and, and look at what I'm doing is because it's so kind of down home to a certain extent. You know, we're a family operation that's going to be, you know, working to make our community better. And I think that's something that that everybody resonates with. If our listeners would like to help out your campaign in this final little stretch of time, how can they do that? Everything basically can be found at lindsayjudd.com, L-I-N-D-S-Y-J-U-D-D.com. All right. Excellent. We'll put the link up for that on our website. So, Lindsay, thank you for for taking the time to to talk to us. And uh, thanks so much for stepping up and running this year. Thank you. Thank you guys for having a podcast. This is awesome. Joining us tonight is Luke Evslin. He is running for county council from Kauai, Hawaii. Welcome, Luke. Thank you guys very much for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to talk to you. Can you start off just by telling us a little bit about yourself, sort of introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us how you came to be running for county council? I was born here on Kauai. I have lived here almost my entire life. I am I went to school a couple of years on the mainland and um, and went to finish up college at the University of Hawaii on Oahu. In my final year at college, I started a canoe building company with my two closest friends from, um, from high school. And we just felt passionate about trying to build up locally made products. We started this canoe building company, which we've now been in business for 11 years. And meanwhile, most other canoe builders in Hawaii have all packed up and, and gone to China. But then after building boats for four years, I was in a bad accident. I was in a canoe paddling race and I got run over by my escort boat and the propeller broke my back and severed my pelvis. Anyway, and sort of long story short, it, it totally changed my life in a, in a ton of ways. Um, the biggest one is which it brought me back home to Kauai. And it, um, you know, I went from sort of just focusing, spending 50 hours a week in our shop and, and I was a competitive hour canoe paddler training 20 hours a week to all of a sudden, I think like any near death experience does for, for somebody at, at a it made me realize, you know, that I hadn't really given back to my community. And during this experience, as I had the accident, I had this real intense sense of connection. It's hard to explain, but it sent a connection with, with everybody, really. And so I came back to Kauai, and I just had to, wanted to figure out what I could do for my community. And so I've slowly, over the last eight years since I've been back home, been just doing more and more community work with some nonprofits, some renewable energy advocacy, some um, boards and commissions with the county of Kauai. And 
then I had this real transformational experience serving on the Citizens Advisory Committee for our Kauai General Plan update, uh, which was, I was the millennial representative or the under 40 representative for the island. And for me, it was the first time that I sort of understood just the transformative power of public policy and the fact that on Kauai, that the housing crisis is really at the center of a lot of the issues that we that we face here. And um, so I just got really passionate about public policy. Uh, to be honest, then Donald Trump was elected sort of in the middle of this. And the day after his election, I um, decided that I was going to get my master's degree in, in public administration with a focus on public policy. And just throughout all of that, through serving on the um, General Plan Advisory Committee, everything points to the county council as the land use body for, for Kauai. So I'm, I'm running um, to try and um, reduce the cost of housing here on Kauai. So what is the kind of makeup of the county council? How how big is this? What are, what is what do the elections for that kind of look like? It's an at large it's actually unique for Hawaii. Most most of Hawaii all has districts, but for the island of Kauai, our island is sort of small enough. We have about seventy two thousand people I think on Kauai. So it's um there's seven at large seats. So every two years, every everybody's up for election. Uh there was twenty four people running through the primary, and then the top 14 get on to the general. So right now there's there's 14 of us running for seven seats. And what has running for office been like? Is it kind of what you expected it to be like? Is it different than what you expected? This year has been by far the craziest year of my life, you know, along with still trying to manage my business, which which the part I do for my business is is customer service and finance. So I can do a lot of that or all of it remotely. But um but along with that I'm still getting my masters and my wife is actually pregnant and due on election day, literally on <laughs> November sixth. And um and at the same time we're also um we live currently in this off grid yurt and we've been trying to um we've been trying to move for the last forever and we finally found a house like six months ago so so in the middle of all this we bought a house that needed a ton of work so we've been spending six months fixing up this house as far as running for office i feel like i'm juggling too many hats with school with business with um preparing for our child and with refurbishing this house so uh, so i would guess that um yeah running for office has been much more about um installing baseboard in my new house than i was expecting <laughs> you know it's been really exciting for me. I mean, it's just totally different than anything I've ever done. And it's, you know, forces you every single day to sort of get out of your comfort zone. You know, and for me, I like, I love public policy. I, I like talking about it, but, um, but I realize that running for office is like 10% talking about public policy and, and 90% uh, other things. So on Kauai, like we have this tradition or all of Hawaii where, where politicians will wave on the side of the street. And I don't know if they do that on the mainland, but so I spend like three days a week waving to passerbys on the side of the street, which is just sort of a, a mortifying experience the first time <laughs> you do it. And, uh, and it doesn't get much easier. And things like, you know, canvassing, going door to door for me has been incredibly humbling. As I think anybody who's spent significant amount of time going door to door, you you know, a lot of people will refuse to talk to you or they tell you get off your yard, you know, or things like that. But for me, it's kind of all part of that. And it's just been recognition that as I as I run here, like, uh, especially the door-to-door stuff. I think it's it's the humbling aspect of that. Like it's easy to get carried away with yourself and, and running for office. It's easy to sort of inflate your ego every step of the way as people are telling you thank you and um, and people listen to you as you talk about public policy. So for me, like going door-to-door has been the best thing because it sort of keeps bringing me down, um, sort of back down to earth. And of, of course, my wife keeps me down to earth also. We often ask female candidates on the show about running for office with kids, but I know you have a daughter and congratulations, you're expecting another child. What is it like to run for office with a family? What is it like to balance parenthood and running for office? Oh my gosh. Even before running for office, just having a kid was the hardest experience of my life. And (laughs) and every day I think, oh my gosh, like every single person has gone through this right if, if you survive as a child that means you put your parents through there's something like this so it was it was so incredibly hard before you know now obviously it's so much harder you know and especially just there's there's an infinite number of events that you can go to you know and i'm sure every candidate is sort of always filled with this uh fear of missing out constantly as you're trying to choose what to go to and it's always to get carried away you know like and just never be there for your family um as you see other candidates going to these things and you feel like you got to go so i think um just for me having a young kid it just forces me to um to always sort of take a step back and be like no this you know the campaign can't be my entire life here and you know one other just part of recognition for that so my wife works you know full-time job and for a while i was the primary um because i could work from home so i was taking care of my daughter from home 
And um, and I even into the campaign, I was still doing a couple of days a week with my daughter. And it was sort of just recognition of, of how much harder I because because women are generally the primary caregivers for their children. It was sort of recognition going into this that how much harder it is for women to run for office. You know, and I and if I go out late at night or or to multiple campaign events in a week, you know, nobody says, oh, my gosh, where's your kids or what are you doing with your kids? Whereas, you know, I know young women who are running with young children, you know, are constantly being, I think, judged as they're, uh, as they're spending more time away from their family. So part of this is just recognition for me. If I win or if I lose, I just really want to support uh, young mothers, especially as they run for office, because it's so much harder for them. It's so one of the issues I know is really important in a place like Hawaii and is something that's important to you is climate change. Can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about the role that the county council might be able to play in in helping address some of the issues of climate change? Yeah, there's so much. I mean, and I constantly hear from people on Kauai or even other people running saying, "Oh, there's nothing that the county can do." You know, this is a global issue or a, or at least a federal issue. But that's just like not true. You know, here on Kauai, transportation emissions from transportation is our largest source of carbon emissions and, and there's not a whole lot that federal policy can do to um to stop us all from driving so much you know and, and a big source of the reason that we're all driving is is land use policy on Kauai especially our towns are basically full and they're relatively low density towns and so most 70 percent of our new development is on agricultural land or very low density residential land far away from town and so because of that Car, uh, vehicle miles traveled on Kauai over the last 10 years have gone up by almost 11%, which is higher than, you know, at least any state in the country. So we just, we're all driving a ton more as we all have to drive a ton more because there's no affordable housing close to jobs. And, um, and that's entirely within the purview of the county council. And I would say that's a problem that was actually created, you know, in the long term from the county council as a land use body for Kauai. So in order to reduce our transportation emissions, we just have to have a goal of ensuring that there's a, there's affordable housing close to our jobs, you know, and making sure that people want to live close to where they work, right? So it's sort of just this whole idea of revitalizing our, our town cores. And uh, and again, there's no federal policy that's going to get us there. This is all going to be local. And I think this applies to probably, you know, most towns and cities across the country. So Hawaii in general is a, a place that's sort of overwhelmingly democratic, but also seems to be the kind of place where incumbents stay in office for a, a very long time. So what does that sort of mean for politics in a state like Hawaii? You know, it, it's a state I think a lot of people don't even think about much in terms of politics because they, you know, just assume, oh, those are just safe democratic votes when we're looking at like yeah. federal elections. But I, you know, what does that sort of feel like from a, you know, public administration kind of standpoint? Does it lead to stagnation? Is there good mm-hmm. competitive races? What's sort of the your sense of that? I don't know how it is in other places, but there is definitely a mentality in Hawaii, you know, where if you challenge an incumbent, um, there's definitely a sense of, oh, who do you think you are? Um, and, um, you know, and I think that there is a sort of strong sense of, of humility in our culture. Like if you live in, and part of it's, I think, from Asian influence maybe in our culture, but uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, just sort of maybe deferring to... Uh, leadership and expertise and people older than you, especially. So as a young person coming in, you got to be really careful not to, um, not to really step on that too much, you know, and be very, very aware of that dynamic. And, um, and I am running right now and there's three open seats for the county council, um, which is, you know, there's three incumbents who are actually all running for mayor. So they've, they've left open three seats, which is very unusual. Uh, whereas, so I can, you know, I can run a really strong campaign because there's those three seats. Whereas if I was running and there were seven incumbents running again, I think it would be a little bit harder. And um, and especially if you're running, you know, for for state house or or the state senate in you know these where there's only one one potential winner, it's a much harder campaign to run, and you rarely see anybody ever challenging an incumbent or any serious challenges to incumbent. Have you you talked a little bit about uh, going door to door, but uh, you know what what is the reception of your campaign been like then? Ha- have people been really open to there being new ideas and new people, or how are they engaging with you? Yeah, it's it's so hard. I think when you 
run because for the most part you're talking to your supporters or people who are reaching out to you or your supporters and i think you can sort of get a little bit like isolated and a little um just bubble of support and thinking, oh, I'm doing a great job, you know, and everything I'm saying is great. And then I think you go, or at least for me, I go to door to door and I'm seeing people that I've, you know, 95% of the doors I know kind of people I've never met before, often with very different concerns. So uh, for me, the door to door is just like an amazing experience to get a better snapshot of the electorate on Kauai. And it also just keeps me realizing how much harder I have to work to reach people. You know, the number of doors that I knock on and, you know, the people have never heard of me or seen my signs anywhere you know it makes me realize i gotta i gotta keep on pushing hard and as far as the reception i think everybody for the most part recognizes that we need change on Kauai. you know we haven't really managed our growth very well the housing crisis is the highest housing costs in the nation and everybody just just sees this and and i don't think you know it might be harder to define exactly what type of change we want but everybody wants some type of change so it's easy enough for me to go and knock on somebody's door and say hey, i'm running and i'm on a fresh face and they they respect that at this moment so would you encourage other millennial candidates to run for office Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, I mean, even if I lose, this has just been such an incredible experience in, in civic engagement. And, you know, I think one big part is just like, I feel like as we all get more and more engaged, especially talking about some of these more difficult issues, it seems like we can move away from ideology and tribalism in a way and sort of see that we all, I think, agree with each other on a lot more than, uh, than it seems like, at least on social media. So for me, just like really uh, uh, engaging with with the, with the um, democratic process has been amazing, and it you know win or lose, I'm committed to continuing. You know, I want to just support candidates as much as I can after this, um, even if I'm not in office. So yes, everybody, I think should run for local office. I mean, well, no, I, sh- I should walk that back a little bit. I think that there's a lot of spaces to participate. You know. Um, through civic engagement, right? If you're a small business owner or if you're coaching whatever, soccer, canoe paddling, or if you're, you know, part of a nonprofit, then you're, you're doing this type of work anyway, you know? And so I don't think running for office is for everybody, but anybody who's sort of been on the fence and already doing this type of community work, I would say, yeah, definitely jump over that fence and go for it. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. All right. If uh, our listeners would like to help support your campaign, how can they do that? My website LukeEvslin.com, L-U-K-E-E-V-S-L-I-N.com. I has a lot more information about my candidacy and why I'm running and who I am. There is a, a contribution page on there, but we're actually, um, you know, we're, I don't I think most people running for office say this, but we're doing totally fine financially and actually don't even need um, any more donations by the end of the year. So people who live on Kauai, if you could, you know, uh, if, if you like what I say and uh, just, just let your friends know that I'm running for office would be super helpful. People who don't live on Kauai, I, uh, I, I guess I don't necessarily need your support at this moment, but I appreciate it. I appreciate your kind thoughts. And if, and if anybody does want to donate financially, that, that's a huge deal. But I think there's a lot more bigger, important races that, or even causes that people could be donating to at this moment. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. This is really great. Was excited to see your campaign. I, I've been looking a lot at the candidates from run for something uh, so yeah. I was excited to to see you running and I, I think it's really important for places that have a sort of a strong sense of incumbency that there be new fresh ideas coming so thanks for stepping up and running this year you know thank you guys so much for the conversation and also just a quick plug for run for something you know anybody who's a millennial and a first or second time candidate should definitely um, reach out to run for something they've been an amazing resource and sort of I think quickly enabled me to get a professional looking campaign without any experience doing it. I've had a couple of people say like, oh, wow, it must be nice having the machine behind you. You know, and I think that's just <laughs> because, and I was like, the machine is there's me and my one friend, is, you know, my acting volunteer campaign manager and my wife. With your interview now, we have spoken to somebody in each of the 50 states. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's amazing. That's, yeah. Uh, you, were, you were the, the person from the 50th state. So Well, thank you guys very much. Thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.